Hello everyone, today we talk about the entheft rents in 13th century France. This was essentially a type of uh, thief that remained uh, more for a longer time, say, than compared to others, uh, connected to a mm, free military service that was in part compensated, however, by this rent. So this entheft rent, also known as borsal or cameral thief, um, that is, as we will see, especially at the end, um, it, it basically represented a hybrid between the you know, feudal service as it was ideally um, conceived as a sort of prepaid, natural um, you know, service in that regard had to be rendered back by the, the vassal uh, to his lord and the free uh, hiring of troops that uh, by the 13th century, by the way, was already uh, becoming uh, pretty much n not just a standard but let's say the, as we've seen mer the mercenary market was expanding dramatically this is the moment of monetization essentially of European economy and by the 14th century this would have taken much more structured forms that would remain substantially invariant until the, the rise of modern modern armies with free companies and so on um, so more of that later, but uh, let's explain fundamentally what this is. So in this, in fifth rent, the payment in m money, right, w was a sort of um, annual pension because the in fifth rent um, basically and clearly procures the royal and princely pensions that will take on so much importance, especially from the end of the 14th century, but, you know, at much higher political and institutional levels to a determined character and determined person that mm, uh, in in this period takes on also the characteristics of an anticipation paid in order to ensure a future eventual service mm, that is these guys were paid um, on a on a regular base for honing that thief as well this is important because here we don't have much time to digress we will talk at some point of the especially the 12th century um, and uh, there are beautiful examples for, from chiefly from the Holy Roman Empire where everything was more you know heterogeneous in a sense um, of how naturally the the ideal of the thief as as we were saying it before that like just I give you the land therefore you owe me a service then in theory is free, for free at that point or better you know, it's compensated by land, but there is no further, no extra payment for your service. It's something that factually, this thing started, let's say, becoming also institutionalized since Carolingian times, at least, but it's also existed in a sense before. Um, never quite worked, mm -hmm. de facto, because either these vassals wouldn't provide the due service, uh, think about the, the collapse of public authority by the 10th century, uh, the the seigneurial the rise at this this point the same monarchies had fundamentally risen through this uh, you know privatization right of power uh, or they were actually paid for the service that is to say yeah I have the land but you know you have to give me some money to <laughs> to come to fight and uh, th there was also um, a substitution sometimes of actually the actual military service with money mm -hmm. this was through, for example, I don't know, in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, mostly for those regions who were more distant from the from the south, which usually the Romfart uh, hap, you know, was uh, was launched, and more distant from royal authority. Um, but this could, was essentially negotiated time after time. So the fifth rent is something similar because it, it has both. It has both the land, so the title, the title with all the you know, all the holdings, uh, the properties, the assets attached, and plus, however, a, a constant pay. So, uh, practically an anticipation, such as the, the thief had to, to be. Um, and this um, is, um, you know, in spite of the clause contained in many um, in institutive documents of such and few of the rents, the latter were in practice, however, not transmissible to the heirs and not even for life. 
So this is an important distinction because it, they were ad hoc. Mm -hmm. You couldn't transmit them together with the the thief proper, uh, and nor they usually happen for for a lifetime. And the beneficiary uh, of of this perceived received the um, the rent for some years usually, and eventually for a reason or another, the contract was terminated. So there are interesting examples. I mean, this stuff happened also in other parts of Europe, but today we make mostly French examples because they're the better documented. So there is the case of Fernando de Juan, that it, as we'll see, was actually a Castilian knight uh, that came to, f uh, uh, to fight for, for the, the King of France. Um, and his example constitutes, uh, provides an example of a fifth rent that contemplated a free service. Mm -hmm provided a free service. And uh, according to an act of 1277, this Castilian knight had uh, abandoned the party of the Castilian king to pass to the one of the French kingdom. So Philip III granted him the same sum uh, at will or for life in exchange. And Fernando uh, committed himself to provide a uh, liege homage against everybody, at least it was the closest, I mean, the, the tightest form of, of, of dependency in, in, the feudal, in the feudal system against everybody except for the nephew Philip III, that was um, son of one of his, um, uh, uh, I mean, of his sister um, uh, Blanche and of Fernando of Castile. So th there were also these you know, ad personam, uh, you know, it's kind of allegiances here, it's a very client early system that naturally flows it here, that the mindset is still, I fight not for a counter or another, right, that's something that up to, you know, the late modern age fundamentally didn't come into these people's mind, they, they, they fought for somebody, right, and kingship is essentially about this, right, these were all communities, then there was a lord at the top, so here they were fighting for individuals, and it was in this case the king of France. They didn't want to fight against uh, the, uh, you know, the the the, the same nephew of uh, Fernand, uh, I mean, the, the the son of Fernand of Castile. And um, furthermore, the new vassal had to serve the king of France with ten knights for free. Mm -hmm for 40 days every year and to uh, show up with his contingent in order to perform this service within six weeks from the convocations. However, he would have not had to fight everywhere, territorially speaking, but only in the lands of the kings of Aragon, of Castile, of Portugal, the Kingdom of Navarre in Gascogne, Gascony, and in the county of Toulouse. And uh, so this is interesting too because he was fighting basically on behalf of the King of France in, in an area that went beyond it, the, 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 French, the same French kingdom. Um, and at this time it's interesting, this, anyhow we'll talk about it another time, what was going on between France and especially Aragon. And, um, and after these 40 days, it would have been the faculty of the King of France to employ uh, Fernando and his men by paying to each of them the daily pay of seven solidi and six um, uh, tournois uh, denari, essentially, but without the reimbursements of the remounts of the horses that uh, were crippled, lost, whatever. Um, which which is an important clause because uh, that costed a freaking lot. I mean, especially the, the mounts were like uh, having a Ferrari at the time or something. So especially the the, the trade that we were talking about just some 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 days ago. Uh, other and fifth rents, however, so you see it's a temporary service, mm -hmm. uh, and that doesn't even cover apparently the, the whole costs and some also the important ones of a military expedition, but more of that later. Other and fear friends, however, were in fact um, less advantageous for, for power. 
For example, the one that Philip IV of France granted in 1294 to a knight of the county of Burgundy, Hugh of Burgundy, in fact, of Bourgogne, if you prefer, um, and he will, he w he would receive every year at the Temple of Paris, the uh, on the day of the Virgin's purification, 300 turquoise pounds, uh, and in 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 exchange for for this sum, that was theoretically perpetual and e even transmissible to the heirs, the knights swore to uh, fealty and. A liege homage to the King of France and uh, commits himself to serve him in case of war against the King of England or other enemies with his men, his castle and his fortresses and at least 60 armed knights or horsemen um, and ever since he will uh, remain in the you know places of his own property he will not uh, he would not perceive any compensation but if philip the fourth will summon him elsewhere he will be uh, benefit of the compensations of the amounts so the clause of this contract um, uh, are explained so this is an advantageous contract mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 for for the knight specifically and it may be explained with the general political conditions even here at the time because in order to oppose to the formidable measures of encirclement uh, enacted by Edward I of England, Philip IV was uh, searching for allies everywhere at every cost. So never underestimate, and we will see it better later, when this, you know, the, the broader policy, it's not just economical, right? You can't just give a, an economical explanation. It's obviously political most of the time, so why these contracts uh, happen in the first place. Um, another example concerns the recruitment of the uh, fighters for the crusade. Uh, with an act of 1249, uh, Alphonse of Poitiers uh, declared to uh, take at his service for a year during the crusade uh, Hugh Lebrun Count of Angoulême with 11 knights, but the mm, perspective of such mm, compensation was not sufficient to convince Lebrun. In fact, he mm, was, um, he granted, in addition, for that reason, uh, uh, an annual rent in hereditary fief uh, of for 600 pounds in Poitou, and even the title of reimbursable loan in four years that was 4,000 uh, turma pounds that were destined to the, the equipment of his contingent. So in these circumstances it can't surprise the, uh, the worry of, of the need manifested by the um, constantly manifested by the constituted powers to maintain if not to strengthen a system of obligations while uh, that system was being substituted ever more frequently by the payment of wages and of different indemnities um, in, uh, that, that were similar in everything uh, to the compensations and the indemnities destined to the true and proper volunteers I mean those people who would basically join for that amount of money mm -hmm to fight. So this is interesting because it's even less I mean these guys were paid technically less than even free mercenaries. Mm -hmm. So it's obvious even he, you understand that there was a thief behind that. A, a, a concrete one, a real asset, some land. So obviously they were also paid less. Mm -hmm. um, but the question is being raised generally speaking as being this one and I wouldn't say it's an excessively clever one, you know, that is why didn't they pass directly, f you know, m looking at, for example, uh, Schmidt and uh, um, terminology from the uh, Lebenskriegtum to the Freie Söldnertum without passing through the Versöldnerte uh, Lehnskriegertum. Uh, 
that is to say, why was this hybrid between essentially the mm, the normal, you know, natural, also hereditary thief, feudal service from uh, to the free uh, mercenaries, say, free uh, hiring. But this passage through the essentially the the hired feudal, the hired vassal, the hired uh, hired feudal service. So the causes naturally can be many, right? In, in, first of all, we look at the nature of the of of, of the same compensation. Uh, when it's possible to know the amount of it, for example, in England starting from the 12th century, or in France from the beginning of the 13th, um, it seems often not a professional salary properly met, but just a sort of campaign indemnity so to allow the mm, the knights uh, the let's say the, the these occasional fighters to uh, cope with the extra costs uh, following to their, their participation to the same military expeditions Hence, also the daily, uh, general, at least in general, the daily character of the pay that corresponds to either brief campaigns or, you know, unpredictably long ones. Um, this is in England, too, in France, as we've seen, where um, there is the, the further uh, evolution of the system for the two great uh, categories of knights and of foot soldiers but um, this is for example in England um, looking at pain in, in, in sterlings um, now we have the knight being paid uh, six denarii between 1150 and 1160 uh, eight during 1160 uh, in um, yeah I mean 1165 the infantryman won one shilling for the, the night towards 1195, uh, two shillings by 1215, and two denarii for the infantryman, two shillings for the night in 1250, uh, two, three, or four shillings for the night in around uh, 1300, and two denarii for the infantryman. In France, in instead Turkmat pounds, we have in 1202, um, seven shillings or six, uh, six denarii for the knight and 10 denarii for, for the infantryman and in 1295 10 shillings 12 shillings and 6 uh, um, denarii or um, 15 shillings uh, for the knight depending on these are the three values and 10 uh, excuse me 12 denarii for the infantryman and um, also well, these were different values also of um, of coins, meaning that, uh, well, uh, the the pure silver here for the denarii was was swinging between uh, uh, wildly at some point, and actually, the um, the lowest ones were paid to to the in fact the, the lowest values were paid to the infantryman. Not surprisingly. Now I don't give you all the numbers, but that tells you how naturally infantrymen were less important than knights, especially in this time where you know it was seeing the peak, the apotheosis of of feudal cavalry, specifically. Now the state of documentation renders difficult to determine if the perceived sums um, in money could be uh, could normally be enough to cover the, the expenses. One could think, could think it is, even if the men-at-arms paid what they consumed, that naturally not always happened. In, in contrary case, uh, we, we wouldn't understand how the proper mercenaries would accept to serve in exchange of the same amount of, of money. Uh, because the, f the pay is offered to an English infantryman towards 1300 are basically at the same level of the mm, of the same uh, 
you know, sal daily salary of a Freemason worker. And it seems that the same equivalence f existed in France, in Florence, and some uh, witnesses induced to think that the knights' pays were not much more lavish. And um, it is a passage from the Chronicle of uh, Matthew Paris that uh, re evokes the. Um, the famine in Gascony but in 1253 it says quote in those days the famine spread in the army of the king at the point that a chicken was sold by six denarii in sterling um, a uh, load of, of grain for 20 pounds uh, a brand of wine uh, for two solid or more and the bread uh, of one one pound costed two or three denarii, so that a knight with two um, silver solidi could barely uh, feed satisfactorily himself and his squire, his servant and his horses. And I so if we think that at this time uh, two solidi were the daily pay of a knight and that uh, this basically equated to from eight to twelve pounds of bread, um, it's acknowledge that in, in those critical circumstances this had been satisfactory for feeding him and his retinue uh, yes but if we take this the, the same measures as we were saying before the infantryman with his two daily denarii could buy for himself only barely one third of pound of bread so it's not by starting from the pay and its daily amount that we can actually understand what this system of military obligations survived uh, for, um, at, you know, given the, the disappearance of gratuitous service from for for the fee, from the fief holders, and it, we should also consider also the problems of investments. And the, or the let's say the anticipated capital provided to the fighters, because with the mean of military convocations, the powers could uh, dispose of fighters who were not only completely equipped and mounted, but also that since youth were tra trained to the crafts of arms and had made the necessary apprenticeship and. Uh, since, as it, you know, others, some scholars have pointed out, let's say, if you don't have trained, uh, at least uh, as a game, into the art of war, you you you, you don't know how to to practice it um, in in uh, when you're going to be called. So, the thief in itself is what allows to its holder and his sons that are growing uh, mature to uh, dispose of the, uh, the in fact the possibility and the means to maintain themselves at the height of the levels reached in the art of war with the exercise of hunting the quintains just but especially the tournaments were you know mm, albeit not without risks in fact and, and that was the training groups of fighters participated so in this sense it's obvious that the mm, uh, the, n the necessity of uh, a further base uh, of a thief of which you know that on which the the the, mm, the, the kingdoms could uh, our powers could play on right to say okay if i give you this extra money for you know performing that military service you will be involved then uh in, in something that will make you hopefully invest in it or maybe I threaten you for it but let's say I give you some conditions for which it's an extra right and these of people that already lived uh, with a nightly uh, with a nightly lifestyle and this is also you know important in and this would explain the the meager compensation sometimes I mean there could be in, in the political thermometer there are minimal variations that could bring these people to go fight there Right, it would have been enough. It was a way also to uh, closing ties to have, let's say, a better connection with certain lords, powers, clientels. We have seen before this switching alli uh, allegiances at the same time, 
and uh, that often also happen in a long range, right? The fact that you depended on a on a lord or another had major implications also in other lands. It wasn't just something local. Um, there was a broader spectrum that has to be evaluated. So this naturally presents you with the uh, the spectrum of all the possible variations that could happen and why would mm, certain uh, thief holders that uh, you know therefore leave normally as knights want to be paid uh, ad hoc right sometimes not even advantageously advantageously speaking to participate in certain military expeditions right they they could have an interest to to even just even defend their uh, you know the monarchy at that point um, and further you know expanding their own maybe receiving other fiefs um, so this is absolutely normal and it fits the broader transition as we've seen from the non-paid uh, thief to the uh, to the free hiring mercenaries and and this tells you even for later times how fundamentally uh, the the structural weight of this military service that was becoming ever more professionalized right here the cost of the mounts as we've seen was very big right um, but could you know be compensated by mobility or immobility or, um, asset that um, would allow in a way or another certain people to leave uh, out of the craft of, of, of arms with that specific equipment um, and that fundamentally would uh, would would work um, on a regular base for for them to, to serve uh, even without holding uh, a thief which is what will, will become in fact increasingly uh, more often afterwards and this also considering that the at that point that the same authorities would increase their um, uh, let's say uh, their control on larger bodies of people through certain specific heads of power so the high nobility that was ever framed more uh, within the the structure of the kingdom and that could therefore be managed oriented towards another direction this these people naturally had their own knights that also were landed sometimes sometimes you know land owners i mean uh, some some others weren't right and um and however the money that was flowing now um, because of the broader enrichment of, of the continent was something ever more, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say, uh, that favored ever more this kind of service in a structural sense in en masse, right? So, for now, we stop here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.